Perfect. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our CT and MRI lecture series. It's a great pleasure to have today Professor Mark Dweck from the University of Edinburgh. For the few there that don't know Mark, uh, he's a well-established imaging, but he imager, but he keeps growing as a rising star. I think the imaging field. He's a, he's a British Heart Foundation senior lecturer and consultant cardiologist at the University of Edinburgh. He does multimodality imaging with echo, CT, MRI, and PET. His main areas of research are aortic stenosis that he won't be talking about today, but coronary disease and uh, activity and burden of coronary disease that it's a very hot topic right now. He has won multiple awards as a BMJ Imaging Team of the Year. He won the Prescience Medal as well from the Royal Society of Medicine and many other awards and he, for you that don't know, actually he was an author of the Scott Hart, Scott Hart trial as well that has changed cardiology and how we practice all over the world. So thank you very much, Mark, for being here. A pleasure to have you. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be part of this, this fantastic series. I've been uh, tuning in each week. Uh, lots of great uh, speakers. So it's, it's very nice to participate in this. Thank you. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about coronary artery disease today. Um, and in particular, focus on uh, the imaging of, of coronary plaque and what we can do with uh, advanced uh, imaging techniques now. Um, but I guess it's important to start um, with a bit of history and, um, and uh, what we've been doing in the past. And I think it's, it's fair to say that over the uh, past, I guess, four or five decades, our treatment of coronary artery disease has been based around an ischemia paradigm. So we've been thinking, uh, making most of our decisions for patients uh, based on um, assessments of myocardial ischemia and concepts of myocardial ischemia trying to reduce uh, patients' uh, ischemic burden. And I think, you know, ischemia undoubtedly remains very important when we're thinking about symptom relief uh, and, uh, and the assessment of patients with uh, possible angina. However, um, consistently, treatment of ischemia has uh, not reduced myocardial inf infarction across multiple RCTs. And I think on that basis, there's been an interest in trying to develop a new paradigm for how we think about coronary disease and how we approach uh, this extremely uh, widespread and difficult problem. So um, I guess the story starts with invasive coronary angiography. And um, of course, when you do an angiogram, you see uh, obstructive tight stenoses and the assumption um, has been, and I think it's still prevalent in a lot of our thinking, that if you see a, a nice tight uh, narrowing like this, that these are the sort of narrowings that are going to cause heart attacks. And you can imagine just a tiny little red blood cell getting stuck in that narrowing and, and causing a heart attack. Um, and on top of that, we had um, these important observational studies um, from my friends and colleagues at, at, based at Cedars demonstrating that uh, the more ischemia you had on uh, SPECT imaging here, the, um, the, more, the worse your prognosis. So the more severe your ischemia, the worse your long-term prognosis. Um, however, I guess the surprise in the field came when the COURAGE trial was published, and that showed that relieving that ischemia with PCI, and of course PCI is an extremely good way of relieving ischemia, didn't have any impact on the incidence of myocardial infarction. And of course, this has more recently been supported by the ischemia trial, where again, uh, relief of um, ischemia, and these patients had a higher ischemic burden than in courage, uh, didn't have any uh, impact on the rates of myocardial infarction at three years. So why is that? Why, we, why do we have um, this discrepancy, this uh, uh, association between ischemia and, my, and events and adverse prognosis, yet we get rid of the ischemia and we have no impact on those events. And um, essentially, I think it's a classical case of correlation versus causation. So ischemia is associated with an adverse prognosis, but it doesn't mean that the ischemia is causing the adverse events with which it's associated. And I think that's borne out um, and supported by the results of uh, courage and of the ischemia trial. So is this of a surprise? Well, um, probably not if we think about uh, the underlying pathophysiology of atherosclerosis. We've known for a long time that um, the majority of heart attacks uh, 
uh, that are caused are caused by culpral lesions that when we looked at them previously on antecedent angiography were non-obstructive. These weren't the tight lesions that we saw on the angiogram, they were the non-obstructive lesions uh, elsewhere in the, in the angiogram. And of course, we know uh, the treatments that reduce myocardial infarction. So things like statins, aspirin, PCSK9 inhibitors, etc. They have uh, an important effect in reducing myocardial infarction, but of course they have absolutely no impact on myocardial ischemia. And conversely, if we think about anti-anginal anti agents, again, very uh, effective at reducing myocardial ischemia, they have no impact on myocardial infarction. So time to return to the drawing board and uh, to maybe think about new ways of thinking about coronary artery disease and in particular risk prediction. Um, so if we go back right to the beginning, then we need to think about what's happening uh, to the plaques when you have an infarct. And of course, this is a very simplistic slide for such a, uh, uh, an impressive audience, but we need to remember that the thing that causes myocardial infarction is plaque rupture, uh, not ischemia plaque rupture. And so um, I think it makes sense for us to return to thinking about the plaque uh, rather than the consequences of the plaque on the myocardium. So how, can, how then might we approach this uh, idea of risk prediction? Well, um, I was fortunate enough to work with Dr. Fuster for a year and he taught me a lot of things. Um, and he has proposed um, this triangle of risk uh, where um, he thinks that we can improve ACS risk prediction by uh, imaging plaque burden, uh, trying to assess disease activity, and uh, not only thinking about the plaque, but also thinking about the blood uh, and the tendency of the blood to clot, the stickiness of the blood, if you like. So if we think about that paradigm and those three triangle, the, those three corners of the triangle uh, in turn. So let's talk about imaging plaque burden uh, to begin with. Now, um, we're pretty good at imaging plaque burden and the basic concept really is that the more plaque a patient has, the more likely that a plaque will rupture uh, at a time when the blood is sticky and cause a myocardial infarction. And um, we can do, as I said, plaque burden assessments with lots of different imaging modalities. Uh, most of the early studies were with IVUS and this very uh, clear relationship between your plaque burden uh, and adverse uh, outcomes uh, was observed. Of course, uh, non-invasively, we can do it effectively with CT calcium scoring. This provides us a surrogate of the total plaque burden, even though it only measures the calcific parts. And the higher your calcium score, uh, the more likely you are to have myocardial infarction. Um, but there's also something about plaque type in here, because not all plaques uh, that uh, occur in the coronary arteries have an equal propensity to rupture. So we have this classical idea of the vulnerable plaque. And this is basically uh, a report of the types of pathological features uh, that culprit plaques have. So when we look at people that have had heart attacks, what do the plaques look like? And they have these certain features that appear to be uh, fairly common. So they have a large necrotic core, positive remodeling, uh, macrophages, thin fibrous cap, and some early uh, calcification. So can we, can we start to image that adverse plaque? Can we start to, to, to see it? And in so doing, can we improve our prediction of who's gonna have events? Well, uh, we can, and there's lots of different imaging modalities that can help us do that. Uh, on CT, uh, the, I think the two best signs on CT are, are positive remodeling and this uh, low attenuation plaque. So this is these dark areas uh, within the plaque, uh, which, uh, or a feature of necrotic core. So basically here we're, we're imaging a large necrotic core when we see this low attenuation. Um, and there's been lots of studies looking at um, the association of the presence of these plaques um, with uh, adverse events. So this is one of the classical pa uh, papers by Dr. Narula and uh, Dr. Motoyama. So lots of patients, over 3,000 patients, and um, uh, 294 of them had adverse plaques and they had a much higher uh, rate of uh, future acute coronary syndromes than the patients who did not have uh, adverse plaques. But um, I guess this points to one of the key problems with uh, vulnerable plaque imaging is that actually um, there's lots and lots of adverse plaques here, but there was only few events. So 294 adverse uh, plaques uh, and few events, 48. So uh, 
whilst uh, it tells you something at the patient level, the patients who tend to develop these high risk plaques are more likely to have events. It doesn't tell you too much at the plaque level because actually the vast majority of these adverse plaques or so-called vulnerable plaques don't ever do anything. They don't translate into uh, adverse events. Um, so we've had a look at um, a similar sort of uh, study design in the Scott Hart trial. Um, and we looked at um, the patients who were in the CT arm of that. So we found that um, 608 patients had an adverse plaque uh, defined on C CT. Um, so uh, a minority of the patients who we imaged. And in those, uh, 25 of those patients had a fatal or non-fatal MI. So uh, not very useful at the plaque level, but at the patient level, uh, these patients were at higher risk of future adverse events. So they had a hazard ratio of, of three for uh, predicting future myocardial infarction, which was higher than the hazard ratio for uh, an obstructive plaque. So that's interesting. Um, but I guess one of the, the criticisms leveled at uh, this vulnerable plaque type imaging with non-invasive imaging is that whilst it tends to um, be associated with patients at higher risk of future events, once you put more simple assessments of plaque burden into the model, actually um, the vulnerable plaques just fall out. So as soon as you put coronary artery calcium score into the model, uh, then actually uh, the, the uh, adverse plaque is no longer predictive. It's just the mark of plaque burden that predicts events. And I think that's probably why we don't uh, report it or I don't spend too much time reporting it in clinical practice at the moment. Um, I guess the, the sort of partial success of that study uh, led us to thinking or trying to think in a slightly uh, different way about imaging uh, adverse plaque. And, and we turned to our colleagues um, at Cedars sinai Damini Day and Piotr Schomka, um, who developed very nice uh, uh, software te technology that not only allows you to identify adverse plaques, uh, in this case, uh, non-calcific or low attenuation uh, plaques, but also allows you to quantify the burden of the, the, those plaques across the coronary artery. So it's not just, yes, no, do you have an adverse plaque, but it's uh, what is the burden of your adverse plaque? How much necrotic core, if you like, do you have uh, uh, in your coronary arteries? Um, and so we, we, again, we went back to the um, Scott Hart data set and we had a look to see uh, whether this assessment, your burden of low attenuation plaque, your burden of necrotic core, uh, did any better in terms of predicting events. Uh, we had follow-up uh, nearly five years and we had 41 heart attacks. Um, and what we found, I guess, similar to the, to the uh, binary method, we found that if you had a high plaque burden above 4%, um, then these patients were five times more likely to have a, a fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction. Um, we found that the adverse plaque burden correlated with, uh, with many of the other traditional assessments of cardiovascular risk, uh, calcium score, um, cardiovascular risk scores. I think, uh, as you'll see, that may be uh, a sign that uh, those other uh, factors are surrogates of, of the adverse plaque burden. Um, but the, the key finding was that uh, the low attenuation plaque burden, your marker of adverse plaque burden, was the most powerful predictor of uh, cardiovascular events. And finally, we had something that uh, beat the calcium score, um, as well as uh, improving risk prediction compared to standard uh, cardiovascular risk scores. So I think this is very interesting. Um, the software now has, has got much easier and better and uh, simpler to use. Um, it's reproducible when you're trying to assess low attenuation plaque burden. And actually you're measuring the thing that you're interested in. You're measuring the plaques that are likely to rupture and uh, or have a higher, a higher risk of rupture. And the more of those you have, the higher risk of myocardial infarction. Uh, we need more studies to try and uh, uh, tease that out, um, data from the ICONIC trial was certainly supportive. So um, I would argue that we're actually pretty good then at measuring atherosclerotic disease burden, so uh, pretty effective at doing that. What about this second corner, the atherosclerotic uh, disease activity? Um, well, I think there's two interesting uh, uh, potential techniques that we can use to measure disease activity. Um, so the first is, is the, the pericoronary fat attenuation. Um, so this has um, been proposed originally by uh, Charis Antonides group in Oxford. And uh, this time we're not looking at the plaque itself. We're actually looking just this, uh, to the side of the plaque and we're looking at the adjacent fat. And the idea is that the structure of this fat changes in response to inflammation within the coronary vasculature. And that the inflammation 
uh, modifies the structure of this fat, and we can measure that difference in its structure by looking at its attenuation. Uh, so it's quite a, a simple uh, concept in some ways. Actually, it's been around for a lot of, a lot of uh, years. If you think about the diagnosis of appendicitis, that's often based on stranding of the fats uh, adjacent to the uh, uh, inflamed appendix sitting next to it. Um, and again, if we, um, if we look at this, um, and we looked at it in the Scott Hart trial, if you have, uh, incre if you have a change in your uh, attenuation of your fat uh, as a sign of coronary inflammation, then you had an increased risk uh, of MACE events. So um, I think that's an interesting um, observation. The, the group in Oxford are doing some great work at um, validating this in lots of different uh, cohorts. Uh, the group in uh, Cedar sinai have got a similar technique. And I think it's definitely one to watch. And of course, the great advantage of this approach is that we can get this information from the standard CT scan. We don't need to do anything fancy uh, or additional to, to gain information about inflammation and disease activity. Um, the other approach uh, does need another scan, and this is uh, turning to PET imaging. So um, we're all, all uh, familiar with PET imaging, mainly in the context of uh, perfusion and viability assessments. But in this, uh, 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 scenario where we're talking about molecular imaging, uh, what we're basically doing is we're trying to measure disease activity in the vasculature. And, and we do that by injecting radio traces, uh, targeting a specific disease process. Um, and basically these traces uh, accumulate in areas of the body where that process is active. So in principle, we can target any disease process we like. We just need a, a tracer that uh, targets it. Uh, and we can uh, develop a map uh, of where the process is active we can fuse it with a CT scan, and we can uh, then localize disease activity to specific structures uh, here in the aortic valve in a patient with aortic stenosis. Um, and the tracer that we've been using, as I said, you can use uh, pretty much any tracer, uh, but the one we've been interested in using is uh, 18F fluoride, which is really a marker of calcification activity. Now, calcification is a, is a healing response in the vasculature, so it tells us a bit about vascular injury as well. And, We've looked at it in lots of different conditions. Um, we've looked at it in atherosclerosis. We're going to talk more about that. We've looked at it in aortic stenosis, uh, prosthetic valve disease, aneurysm disease. Uh, we've even looked at it in erectile dysfunction. And it kind of gives us the same information across all these different uh, disease states. And it is a marker of vascular injury and of calcification activity. So what about the coronaries? Well, um, we can see uh, uptake of our tracer in the coronary arteries. Um, we can localize it to specific areas within the coronary arteries and um, individual uh, lesions. And uh, like in other systems, it, it works as, an, as a marker of disease activity and it predicts disease progression. So if you think about it at uh, the patient level, uh, patients that are, have sodium fluoride positive plaques in their vasculature, they demonstrate an increase in their calcium score at one year. Uh, patients that don't have uh, sodium fluoride activity uh, don't demonstrate any increase in their calcium score. And it works also if we think about it at the plaque level. So there's a, a positive plaque uh, in the LAD. You can see the baseline CT here, a bit of calcium there, uh, quite a lot of uh, fluoride activity. And when you repeat the scan, this calcium has progressed and the calcium score in that area is uh, increased. Um, but perhaps more interestingly is its relationship with uh, plaque rupture and cul uh, culprit coronary artery. So uh, we did a study, um, it's quite a while ago now, six years, uh, but we looked at patients who um, had had a heart attack. So here's one of those patients. As you can see, they're having a, a, an anterior MI. Their proximal LAD is occluded with um, uh, thrombus. Uh, and when the patient has their, their PCI, they did extremely well. We did a scan a few days later, and the culprit plaque has lit up uh, with uh, the PET tracer. Um, so we can identify um, culprit plaques, um, but that's kind of not all that useful because you know, we know what the culprit is, we've seen it on the angiogram. What we really want to do is to be able to predict myocardial infarction uh, prospectively. Um, so we've done a, a, a study, um, it was published just last year, where we've looked at baseline uh, PET-CT scans um, in nearly 300 patients, all of whom had a really quite advanced coronary artery disease. They're all on secondary prevention, a lot of them had previous PCI, myocardial infarction, or bypass operations. And we then followed them up uh, to see whether the, the baseline PET activity uh, predicted myocardial infarction. Um, you can see some of examples of uptake in the coronary arteries. We actually used the new uh, image analysis methodology in this, where uh, 
we, we're trying to focus here on measuring disease activity across the whole coronary vasculature rather than you know, trying to measure just activity in individual plaques. We're trying to look at activity across the vasculature. As I kind of alluded to before, I think if we're going to try and predict events, that's a much more effective way of doing it than focusing on, you know, focus on the level of the patient rather than the plaque. Um, and in doing that, what we uh, were able to do was to divide, divide the cohort really into to three groups. So there were some patients who had absolutely no activity in their coronary arteries. Um, these patients appeared to have uh, extremely stable disease, and we didn't see any uh, myocardial infarction uh, in those groups at all. In the other patients, if, if we looked at um, patients uh, who had increased activity, we saw uh, a separation of the Kaplan Meier curve. And this appeared particularly true in the patients with, with really quite high activity, uh, CMA values over one and a half. And in these patients, you had an eightfold uh, risk of myocardial infarction. And in this patient group, these people with very advanced coronary disease, established coronary artery disease, fluoride was the, the strongest predictor of myocardial infarction. It, it outperformed uh, markers of plaque burden, uh, the uh, severity of uh, luminal obstruction, cardiovascular risk scores, et cetera. So, um, it's interesting data. It's a different population from Scott Hart and the plaque assessments that I was showing you earlier. But in, these, in this group of very advanced atherosclerosis, perhaps assessments of disease activity can help because we know actually these patients all have a lot of plaque. They all have very high plaque burdens. Um, that's a, a single study and um, we need to confirm it. And the ongoing preferred trial is, is happening. We've completed recruitment into this. So this is a bigger study, 700 patients with multivessel uh, coronary artery disease. And we're looking to see whether baseline PET um, improves the prediction of uh, myocardial infarction compared to CT. And that's quite a, that's quite a tough ask, as I alluded to, CT is already very good at predicting myocardial infarction, uh, particularly with the plaque burden assessments. So we want to know whether there's any value, can we, can we improve on it using the PET imaging? Um, so, um, this is the final corner of our uh, triangle. So what can we do about the blood? And it's pretty difficult actually to measure uh, stickiness of the blood. It varies quite a lot during the course, e even uh, a day. Um, of course, patients who smoke and things who have sticky blood are at higher risk of myocardial infarction. Uh, can we image it? Um, and um, I think maybe we can. Uh, there's a very exciting new pet tracer called 18FGP1. And it appears to localize very avidly to uh, fresh thrombus. So these are some case reports that have come from Korea. And you can see, I love this picture because you can work out what happened to this patient. So this patient uh, presented uh, with collapse and uh, they ended up having a, a GP1 uh, scan. And uh, what you can see here is you can work out the mechanism of the collapse because you can see uptake of the tracer in the leg. So the patient had a DVT. Uh, this then tracks up to the lungs, so they've got a uh, big bilateral pulmonary emboli. And you can even see the, the site of laceration on the face where the patient bumped their, bumped their chin. Um, other case reports have reported it in patients who've had stroke. You can see uptake here in a culprit vessel following a uh, stroke. Um, and um, here's an example where you, you can see these two plaques. Now, if you looked at just the CT, you'd pretty much bet your life that this was the culprit plaque because it's uh, low attenuation, uh, it's bulky, it's almost obstructive. And on this side, it all looks very stable and calcified. But actually, if you look for the thrombus uptake, it localizes to this plaque. So uh, interesting. Uh, and of course, that was uh, corroborated by the CT head where you can see the thrombus and the stroke uh, on the side of, of this culprit plaque here. Can you do it in the coronaries? Well, uh, potentially, yeah, we've done a few studies now uh, in a couple of patients. This is a patient who had a very high thrombus load in the right coronary artery, and you can see clear uptake on the, on the CT, but also clear uh, binding of the PET agent in that area. We're doing uh, more studies trying to look at that in more detail. Um, so I guess that's an overview of um, assessments of uh, coronary plaque burden, plaque type, and disease activity. Um, I couldn't give a talk on uh, coronary arteries without talking about the Scott Hart uh, study briefly. So um, uh, I've kind of framed it how we, uh, how we are approaching coronary artery imaging in Edinburgh at the moment clinically. And of course, it's based on, on the Scott Hart trial led by uh, Professor Newby. Um, and just to remind you, um, this was a randomized controlled trial um, looking at patients presenting to uh, the chest pain clinic uh, here uh, in Scotland. 
And essentially, uh, patients were randomized either to the standard of care uh, or the standard of care plus a CT coronary angiogram. So we're adding CT coronary angiography to our standard of care. And in Edinburgh at, at that time and across Scotland, then frequently the standard of care was a treadmill test. So um, 2,000 patients uh, randomized to, to both arms. Um, and the, the headline really was that um, if you got randomized to the CT arm, uh, your risk of myocardial infarction was uh, reduced uh, by 41%. So um, I think as an imager, this is a very exciting slide for me because, you know, this isn't any, um, anything fancy that we've done. This isn't a new stent. This isn't a new uh, uh, medical therapy or anything. This is just us using an imaging uh, assessment to better guide the, the standard therapies that we already have uh, to the right patients. And so I think if you believe that imaging is a good way of uh, impacting patient care and improving outcomes, then this is an exciting slide uh, supporting that concept. Um, so these are the, the um, uh, estimates. So you can see, if you look at cause of death, there's a signal to reduce uh, uh, cardiovascular deaths and, and coronary heart disease death. Um, they don't reach statistical significance. Um, the hazard ratios are pretty similar to uh, the hazard ratios for myocardial infarction. Uh, we're going to follow up these patients for longer. Uh, we'll see if uh, these become significant, but there was no signal to any, any difference in all cause death. So what's the mechanism for this? Why, did, why was a CT scan able to reduce myocardial infarction? And I think basically it's, it's that we were able to target um, treatments uh, to the right patient. And we were quite proactive in this. So if we saw that patients had coronary artery disease and that included uh, the presence of non-obstructive as well as obstructive plaque, uh, we wrote uh, suggesting that they should be on uh, preventative therapy, in particular uh, aspirin and statins. And that translates into higher use of those two medications, those preventative medications in the CT arm. Um, but we also wrote uh, recommending that if they are completely normal coronary arteries to, to stop these therapies. So not only did we start therapies uh, in some patients, we stopped it in others. And in total, about a quarter of patients had a change in their therapy uh, based on uh, their CT scan. And what that means was that um, we were pretty good at targeting statins and aspirin to patients with coronary artery disease in the trial. So patients with coronary artery disease had high rates of statins and aspirin. Patients with no coronary artery disease, normal coronary arteries had uh, low rates. The right patient gets the right treatment. Um, and I think that's the mechanism for why, for why the uh, events are reduced. There might be other mechanisms. Um, we can talk about that in more detail. Um, I think there is something about showing patients their coronary arteries. You show them their arteries, the plaque in, on their scan. I think it might be more likely for them to uh, modify their lifestyle uh, beneficially. Um, we're going to tease that out in future studies. Um, so how do we use it? Well, um, in the UK, we have the NICE guidelines. And... Um, they're partly based on, on uh, the Scott Hart data, but um, uh, they were actually published before the, the publication of that uh, five-year outcome study. And basically, I think they're good. Uh, and I, I basically use them in my assessment of patients. Um, they put a lot of emphasis on the history. And I think that's important. We have to listen to our patients. We have to listen carefully for their description of their chest pain. And they focus on uh, the classical uh, central chest discomfort, its relation to exertion and stress, and whether it's relieved by rest or not. And essentially, if you have all three of those characteristics, you have typ typical angina. If you've got two, you've got atypical angina. And these patients are recommended for CT imaging. So there's no uh, pretest probability score. Essentially, this assessment of chest pain type serves as your pretest probability score. And patients who don't have any of those features or have only one of those characteristics they're uh, deemed to have non-anginal or non-cardiac chest pain, and they're not to have any further testing. So you can decide whether you give them aspirin or statin depending on their risk score, um, but they're not recommended for CT imaging. Um, so if you have typical or atypical angina, then you have a CT uh, angiogram. And actually, when I see these patients, if I make that diagnosis in the clinic, I request a CT, and at that time, I start them on aspirin, statin, and I start them on a beta blocker. And the beta blocker, I think, is useful because, A, it gives you uh, more likely to give you a good quality CT coronary angiogram. You're going to get better rate control. But then also, once I see them back after their CT scan in the clinic, if they've got an obstructive lesion or a lesion that may uh, is borderline obstructive, 
they've had a trial of anti-anginal therapy. And so if they come back, they've got an obstructive stenosis, but their angina is controlled and gone, which actually frequently happens, then I don't need to send them to the, the cath lab. Their angina is controlled. Um, and so we can reduce the amount of onward referrals onto the for invasive angiography. Um, so I said, I see them back in the clinic after their scan. Uh, if they've got three vessel left main stem disease, I send them to the cath lab and I send patients with obstructive stenosis um, to the cath lab, but only if they have recalcitrant symptoms following their, uh, their period of anti-anginal therapy. And if they've got normal coronary arteries, I tend to stop their uh, medications. I mean, I sometimes make some exceptions in patients with especially high cholesterol levels, lots and lots of risk factors, but generally I try and stop uh, the, the, um, the medication because actually uh, those are the patients that were happiest in the Scott Hart trial, the people who had normal coronary arteries who could stop their tablets. So we want to make our patients happy. Um, what about asymptomatic patients? Um, a lot of the principles that we talk about in Scott Hart, um, the idea of plaque predicting events, um, theoretically and conceptually should apply also to asymptomatic patients. Um, and so, um, and also actually when you looked at the Scott Hart trial, if you looked at the patients with non-anginal chest pain, so the people who wouldn't actually get a, a CT scan in the, according to the NICE criteria, their kaplan my curves separated as well, and the hazard ratio was pretty similar in those patients as to the patients with more traditional angina. So on that basis, we've designed the Scott Hart 2 trial, and that's ongoing at the moment. And basically the idea is that we're going to use um, uh, CT to, um, to guide primary prevention in patients between the age of 50 and, and 70. And obviously we need a higher uh, uh, sample size. We need 6,000 patients recruited across Scotland. And they're going to be randomized either to um, uh, the prescription of prime prevention treatment with uh, cardiovascular risk scores, in this case, the assigned risk score, that's our local risk score, or the prescription according to their CTCA. And you can see that we're going to uh, target aspirin and statins to patients with non obstructive disease. Uh, and the people with obstructive disease, we're going to add in ACE inhibitors. Um, crucially, we're, we're only going to um, refer, get referral to a cardiologist if they've got three vessel or left main stem disease um, and they'll be seen by a cardiologist. So people with obstructive disease that's asymptomatic, uh, they're not gonna, uh, they're gonna be blinded to that information and uh, they're not gonna refer to a cardiologist to try and avoid unnecessary caths. And the follow-up is, is looking at um, uh, uh, myocardial infarction and, and death. So um, that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I guess my conclusions are, are uh, firstly, that you know, for a long time we have been relying on this ischemia paradigm for coronary artery disease. But whilst ischemia is associated with an adverse prognosis, uh, reducing ischemia does not um, reduce those events, and the relationship that therefore does not appear causal. Um, so I think probably ischemia is, is a surrogate for the atherosclerotic plaque burden. So um, that means that you can stent a lesion, you can get rid of the ischemia, but you haven't done much to change the plaque burden, and therefore their risk remains high. And so I think we should try and uh, change our way of thinking away from ischemia, more towards plaque burden, plaque type, plaque uh, activity assessments. Um, and I think that will help us to uh, appropriately guide treatment for our patients. So I would encourage you all to, to think about plaque, think about patients in terms of their plaque. Don't forget ischemia when we're talking about symptoms, but really try and modify our paradigm of approaching coronary artery disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a great lecture. Uh, very exciting to see the, the use of multimodality imaging for, for different, different purposes. Uh, so uh, please type your questions as a QA and we'll go over them. Uh, I think I can start with, uh, I'll start with two questions. Uh, first one is uh, for the, I, I think it's very interesting, the non-anginal chest pain patients, right? And obviously you guys think so too, because you're doing a trial on that. Uh, do you think the calcium, calcium score as a gatekeeper could have a role in these patients with a non-anginal chest pain? Uh, and the other one is, uh, what is the difference in, in the workup that you do or what we should be doing for young patients, those patients that have chest pain and they are under 40 years of age or, or 50 as a female? Does that make a difference in your assessment? Yeah, so I mean, at the moment, I, um... In patients who've got non-anginal chest pain, I mean, effectively, they're asymptomatic, aren't they? We, we don't think they've got symptoms due to their heart. So, um, you know, at the moment, I think I agree with the NICE guidelines. We should treat them 
as an asymptomatic uh, population. And so, you know, basically in the UK, that means cardiovascular risk scores to determine primary prevention. Now, you know, cardiovascular risk scores have their problems and um, all the guidelines. They've never been tested in a randomized control trial. I think Scott Hart 2 will be the first trial that's ever actually tested them in the context of a randomized control trial. So, um, and we'll see, we'll see if they're as effective um, as, a, as an assessment where you look directly at the heart. I mean, I'm an imager, I like CT. I kind of believe that you're gonna get better targeting of therapies if you actually direct it on the basis of their imaging. So you give it to the patients who actually have atherosclerotic plaque in their arteries. I think that's gonna be a more effective strategy. But um, of course that comes with a price, that comes with a whole headache in terms of screening and how do you deliver that. So we've got to demonstrate a that that um, strategy is effective and also you know cost effective. Um, but at the moment, you know, in answer to your question, I, I, I deal with them as if they were asymptomatic. So I, I um, you know, but then of course, you know, the truth is is that assessment of symptoms is difficult, and 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 actually, um, even though the, one of the tests I actually find quite helpful is the, is the exercise treadmill test, and that's not for a diagnosis of coronary disease. It's for just seeing a patient exercise in front of me and trying to work out if they've got angina and do they actually develop symptoms in front of me uh, whilst they're exercising. I think it's still quite a helpful test when you're not sure about someone's symptomatic status. Um, and then you, in answer to your question about the younger patients, um, well, I think it all comes down to the history again and risk factors and things, but um, I've just been on, on call for CCU. I've had lots of, I've, well, I've had at least five patients in the last week who've had big heart attacks in their 30s. So, you know, I don't think um, we can just use age as a cutoff. And I think the radiation doses of CT coronary angiography are, are small now. And, um, you know, if you're worried about that patient, then, then they should get a CT coronary angiogram. That, that's certainly my practice. I mean, the very young patients, people in their young, you know, their 20s and normal cholesterols and stuff, it's so unlikely that, <laughs> you know, uh, you need to be pragmatic, but... Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a specific age barrier. I think it comes down to the clinical assessment. Yeah, here, that comes more from our insurance companies here. And then we have usually the cutoff of 40 years of age and, you know, okay. for, to get it approved, at least in, in New York State. Uh, yeah. okay. I agree with you completely. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's no questions coming in, so I'll, I'll ask you another question. Uh, what do you think about the, the treatment for this uh, plaque activity could be, and there's many other therapies such as colchicine for inflammation or, or further lowering of uh, LDL or LP little a, what, what do you foresee as a, as a target for that? Yeah. So, um, I guess, you know, the question is like, how would you, how are you going to use, um, the fluoride PET imaging? And I think it is in, you know, I don't think you're going to be using PET imaging in low risk patients. I think its value is in the people who, you know, got uh, established uh, extensive disease. So their CT is less useful. As soon as you've got stents and um, very high plaque burdens, the CT is less helpful. And um, I think an assessment of disease activity might be useful. So then the question is, what do you do about it? And I think there's, there's two things. So one is, you know, the people that, actually I think the most useful thing is in people who've got high plaque burdens, high calcium scores, but have no disease activity, no fluoride activity. So we didn't see any heart attacks in that group. And so actually here's a group where we can actually de, we can avoid um, expensive and very invasive treatment. So maybe, you know, so we don't need to use a PCSK9 inhibitor or canacunumab or, you know, colchicine or whatever in that patient because they, they appear stable. And equally, maybe, you know, they don't need, um, you know, bypass surgery potentially. Potentially if you've got three vessel disease and, stable disease and it's not active, perhaps you don't need to have a massive bypass operation. So I think actually that's maybe the more useful group where we don't see the disease activity and we can just relax. But in the group who have very intense activity, then yeah, I think that all these other more expensive and invasive treatments become, uh, you know, um, more uh, conceptually attractive. But of course, you know, that's one study and we need to, we need to wait for the follow-up studies before we use it in clinical practice. And do you think uh, imaging on the heart for that and as a global race, uh, I like that you talked about a global race and the thing from Fuster and Armin uh, talking about that burden. Do you think the coronaries are the, the first target or should we 
look more as uh, in the aorta or iliacs as it has been described? Yeah, uh, I, I personally think we should go for the coronaries because you know most of the events are in the in the coronary arteries, um, and um, of course, you know what's happening. You know the, the disease processes are linked in the aorta, the carotids, and the coronaries, but they're not the same. There are important differences in uh, certainly in the activity. Like you can't really predict what the coronaries are going to show from what's happening in the aorta, and we've got a paper actually. Um, just in preparation at the moment, where if you look at uptake in the aorta, that appears to be associated with your risk of stroke, but not your risk of myocardial infarction. Whereas if you look at uh, fluoride activity in the coronaries, that is associated with the risk of myocardial infarction, but not of stroke. So I think there is a difference between what's happening in, in the vascular beds. And, um, you know, it is conceptually attractive to do ultrasound because you can do it there and then point of care. But you know, CT, well, CT imaging of the, the heart is easy now. I don't think that's such a big barrier. So I, my personal view is that if you're interested in myocardial infarction and prediction, prediction of that, you should look at the coronary arteries. That's great. I think uh, we have a question from Dr. Berman from Cedar sinai He says, uh, the changes in Scott Heart in prevention were considered the primary drivers of MI difference. In the asymptomatic patient, wouldn't calcium score, wouldn't CAC scanning be sufficient to identify patients at high risk and begin treatment? Uh, yeah, I think that is a, that's a great point from Dr. Berman. I mean, I think you could make the argument that you could do the Scott Hart T trial with, um, with calcium scoring instead of the contrast CTA. I think there's arguments both ways. So the arguments in favor of a calcium score is that it's quicker and cheaper and, um, you know, and more simple. The, the argument in favor of a CT coronary angiogram is that it's a more complete assessment of the coronary arteries. You see non-calcific plaque that may be important in a minority of patients. Uh, but also there's the opportunity to pick up left main and three vessel disease. Um, and, you know, that's potentially important. Again, it's a small number of patients. I think actually the most important thing might be just reassurance. Uh, I think there's a, there's a worry in doing this type of imaging in asymptomatic patients that we're going to be sending a lot of people to the cath lab. And I think actually the CT coronary angiography means you're going to be sending less patients to the cath lab uh, than, you know, CT calcium scoring because you're going to probably have a lot, potentially have more downstream testing if you have high calcium scores. Whereas I think if you're strict with the CT coronary angiogram and you say we're only going to send people to cardiologists or the cath lab if they've got three, ves uh, three vessel disease, left main stem disease, then you're going to avoid a lot of that downstream testing. So we had a lot of back and forth about this when we designed the trial. The reviewers' comments raised this. We had a lot of discussion. In the end, we went for CTCA. And one of the main reasons, actually, if you've been completely honest, is that we had pilot data for CTCA from the Scott Hart <laughs> one trial because we had this, you know, we could we could do the power calculations based on um, the patients with non-anginal chest pain. Uh, and we could work out, you know, uh, study. Are you doing like CAC that. scores before every CTCA or not in these patients? Uh, uh, we're not. No, we're not. Okay. Uh, I think the, the other thing as a, as a help guide for all the imagers here, so in your reports, when do you suggest to, uh, to de-escalate, de to decrease therapy, and when do you suggest a statin? How do you, how do you decide on that? In your yeah, I mean, I've got quite a simplistic view on it, and it's just that if you've got normal coronary arteries, I think you can stop your therapy with a few exceptions, and if you've got non-obstructive plaque, you should have a statin for sure and consideration of an aspirin. Uh, there might be a different threshold somewhere that maybe you need a certain amount of non-obstructive non plaque before you gain benefit, but I just see it simply like that, that once you've seen the disease process in their arteries, I think, you know, a statin is, is a benign, cheap way of, of preventing that disease from progressing and causing problems down the line. So I have that. At the moment, in the absence of any other data, that's my threshold. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. This was an outstanding lecture. And so looking forward to seeing the results of the Scott Hart too. Great, thanks, Landon.